Hello, recently I was working on this JVC BRDV3000, which is a small and large size DV deck. And I got it working, but left a few uh, loose ends on it. We didn't have the right power supply. And there was also an issue with some tapes giving errors. So I have a power supply and I have some of the connectors, which will hopefully fit the uh, power socket because it's a slightly unusual socket. So let's put that together first, get it powered up, and then have another look at the error problems. Also, I want to see if we can find a way to um, get it to accept and record on uh, DVC Pro tapes, which are the same size as large DV cam tapes, but have different uh, signals possibly on these uh, connectors and cause the machine to just spit it out. Right, let's get stuck in. Remember when I got it, all the screws were missing from the cabinet. So I fitted some, but they're silver. They'll just have to do. Right, now, this power connector is unusual. It's uh, 12 volt center positive, but it has a pin on the plug rather than a pin on the socket. So it's the opposite way around most power connectors. I believe that's the same type as is used in the uh, Sony DSR11 and also some converter decks. I've got ADVC1000 DV to SDI bridge. So I bought these on eBay. First things first, do they physically fit? It looks right. Oh no, that's too wide. So though it's the same kind of connector, that it has the male pin in the middle. It's not as wide as that. So uh, I've messed up, haven't I? Oh, what a nuisance. The power supply I've bought is 12 volt, five amp. You remember that uh, we were having trouble powering it from a, con a power adapter that should have had enough capacity for this, but this is drawing somewhat more current than the uh, instructions said it would. Here's the power adapter I've bought with this um, Hilarious mains plug. What's this about then, hey? It's got a sleeved earth pin. That's a complete no-no. And it has no fuse. Why would anybody make a cable like that? It says it's CE marked. Well, it clearly isn't. That's fake. There's nothing for that but for the bin. So uh, I will be replying uh, on eBay to this seller saying that you're selling dangerous illegal power cables better to just throw the power cables in the bin power supply itself may be fine but that will not fit the socket because that has a female connector and that has a female connector so they won't work looking at the incorrect connector i bought the diameter is there is around six millimeters. But the internal diameter on the socket, it's um, maybe five or possibly slightly less than five millimeters. Yes, I think it's five millimeter. Okay, so I've ordered the uh, an adapter actually, which will hopefully allow me to connect this power supply into this socket, which is five millimeters uh, diameter with a center pin. So uh, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do in the meantime. That's a bit of an awkward one, isn't it? Special delivery. Oh, thank you, Alex. So what have we got here? Oh, wow. Pico program meter with audio inputs and power. And there's an LED here. And that this is a really uh, key feature of this. It's useful for detecting phase errors on your channels. So really I'd like to have a play with that. But you know, something I've been missing for a long time. I've not actually had a, a decent uh, signal generator, well any kind of signal generator. So I could really use something like that. I'm not quite sure Special I'm gonna delivery. test it. Oh, what's in this then? This could be useful, couldn't it? Okay, nothing terribly uh, sophisticated, but we have a signal generator to hook that up with. Ideal. Okay, so this will be able to give us uh, a sine wave output for testing this uh, program meter. And I wonder if I could use a capacitor to give me a phase error between two channels to see if we can test this. Uh, if I use, say, one kilohertz and then some capacitor values, I might be able to uh, delay one side by enough that this can detect it. Let's give that a whirl. 
Okay, hooking up with a, a proper power cable, not that awful thing that came with this uh, power supply. Oh wow, I don't know if you can see that the uh, meters are not backlit, surface lit. Let's try and take the uh, lighting down in here a little bit. So they're very attractively lit from both sides with white LEDs. All right, connected this to a USB power supply. This looks pretty good actually. So let's have about one kilohertz, shall we? Right, one kilohertz output. I'll just uh, confirm that that's working. Okay, I'm gonna be looking for probably about uh, less than one volt peak to peak signal going into this. So that's probably in the order of things there. Right, let's hook that up to this. Now these are balanced inputs, but it does tell you in instructions which input pins to use. Now there is an option for um, AES operation. So that would have uh, optional extra AES digital input. Uh, don't know if this one's got that, so we will take the lid off later and have a look. Actually, that could be extremely useful. Okay, I have my one kilohertz sign signal connected to one of these channels. And the green light is on because it's not seeing a phase error between the two channels. Uh, it's, if you go low signal, that light goes out. I guess that just means there's no signal, so there's nothing to report. Right, I now have the signal uh, really horribly rigged up to the rear connectors and so we have our green indication there. So if I now misphase them, I'm not sure if this is going to work because I might hit grounding errors, but let's see what happens if I misphase uh, one of the channels. I didn't do what I expected because I now have uh, the signals connected the wrong way around on the uh, channels compared to each other. So uh, that didn't quite go as I expected. Interesting to see the peak lights operate at slightly different amplitudes on the two channels. But uh, yeah, since I have the misphased, I don't know why it's not detecting that. Well, I've decided it's almost certainly because I'm messing the wiring up too badly here. What we're going to do later is hook this up to uh, an actual piece of equipment such as DigiBeta or DVC Pro. But before we do that, I want to have a look inside to see if we have the AES uh, um, option. It looks like it's never been apart because that uh, label is over the screw there. Seems a bit criminal to take it apart, really. Okay, I'll uh, get down so you can get a better view of that. All right, there doesn't seem to be much information on uh, where the AES option would go, just in case you're not sure what I'm talking about. This is the digital audio signal, uh, the same, kind of, the same signal as SPDIF, which is used in consumer equipment, but with balanced outputs. Uh, electrically, it's almost identical. Uh, and there would be an option card in here somewhere for that feature if it was installed. Uh, not clear to me where it would go, so I don't believe it is installed here. So our balanced input and loop-through outputs all come to this connector on the edge of the board which has some spare signals I didn't use and then this feeds out to the two ppm meters at the front what you don't do is start fiddling with these uh, you misalign it it's been very accurately set at factory for reading proper uh, PPM levels. A very sweet little toroidal transformer in there. Okay, that's it. it's inside. Um, I think I'm going to see if I can hook this up to one of my professional machines if I have enough balanced cables. That's the only thing that worries me. I may not have the right kind of cabling. But let's see if I can uh, connect this up. Okay, so I have the uh, PPM meter now installed here. It's actually connected to a digital beta cam 
uh, recorder which also supports analog and also does routing for uh, analog signals from uh, umatic via a time based corrector so if i just switch on the test signals from that that's video and that's audio they appear down here on my uh, professional monitor that's the control panel for the monitor so that's all working nicely and if we look at the ppm meters they're reading five on the scale where the machine is putting out minus 20 db uh, you tell me if that's correct i presume that it is so all well and good but by some horrible coincidence when i um connected all this up the uh beta cam machine has expired so if I put in an analog tape the audio is all fine there but the picture is very not fine something horrible has happened to the picture so I think we have a tape path fault or some other breakdown in my uh, Digibeta, that's uh, very upsetting. So that's the unfortunate thing about having this layout. I don't have it rack mounted, so that's under all this other equipment, including the machine, I've, this equipment I've just installed. All this is going to have to come off so I can gain access to the uh, Digibeta. Highly non-optimized, but I don't have room for 19 inch racks in here. Right, after a lot of huffing and puffing, I've moved the machine from a stack of video recorders there, it used to be at the bottom, over to here, which has been extremely hard because it's re-cable all these video recorders, it's been an enormous job. But uh, yes, now we have our uh, lovely meters there, our audio meters, and this is playing an analog tape at the moment, and that's playing just fine. You notice that the stop light flashes well that's because uh, there's no video input so if I uh, switch on some more equipment here switch on the test signal from a time based corrector that's feeding this machine then the uh, stop light stops flashing and we'll restart again as soon as I um, take that signal away whether that would cause a problem when you're playing a tape and you switch the reference input on and off, I don't know, it might drift as it tries to synchronise in with the incoming signal. Well, when I started this video, I was looking at a little JVC deck, and then I started looking at some PPM uh, audio meters, and I end up with a broken digibeater. That's not how I plan things. Let's have a quick look at this. I'm pretty certain we can't fix it right now, but let's at least try to understand where the fault could lie. Now, just in case you don't know what the capabilities of these things are, this is a DVW A500P, which means it's a digital recorder, but it can also play back analog Betacam SP and even Betacam Oxide tapes, uh, and the P means it's PAL. So we I find with, with problems with the uh, deck which can do analog and digital that sometimes it can be helpful to look at the analog playback. I think you can learn more from that than you can from digital. Same is true of something like a digital 8 camcorder. You can get more information about what's wrong by playing an analog tape than you can by playing a digital one. So pop in an analog tape. So we've put in the analog. <laughs> just don't believe it. I put the analog tape in it place just fine. Oh good heavens. It's a funny old world we live in. When this was down in the studio, it didn't work. And all I've done is lugged it up the stairs. And now it does work. Let's put a digital tape in and see what it does. It's playing back just fine. Channel condition green. Huh. 
I don't know what to make of it. It's absolutely fine, channel condition green. Okay, let's have a think about this. When it was in the fault condition, the problem was that analog playback had a filthy great line through the middle. The top of the picture was really bad and the bottom of the picture was fairly bad and there was a line. So normally if I saw that on an analog player, I would say there's some sort of tape path fault. Uh, but I checked the tape path and I will do so again in a minute. I'll show you what I did. I then tried, well, I tried cleaning the heads both manually and with cleaner tapes, and that made no difference at all. Uh, I then tried a digital tape, and the effect was that the picture was watch well, visible, but there were lots of blocks in it, and the channel condition was flashing red between red and orange. So uh, clearly there was still a problem there. Uh, now I was thinking, could be a clogged head. Well. Does it use the same heads for analog and digital playback? I'll have to go and look in the service manual. I'll try to leave some notes and information below if I manage to prove one way or the other. If it doesn't use the same heads for analog and digital playback, then that pretty much rules out a head problem because it was affected in both analog and digital. If it does use the same heads, well, maybe it was a head clog. But the fault didn't look like that. Why a line through the middle? I can't think of any reason for Betacam uh, to do that. So I was thinking, well, we've all but ruled out a tape path fault because it clearly looks like the tape is nice and uh, flat against the, all the surfaces it should be flat against. Uh, and not using the same heads, then we've ruled out heads. So what's left? It's an electronic fault. Uh, such as a head switching error, something like that. I then did a recording. Now, of course, it can only record in digital, but I did a test recording on this and tried to play it back on another machine and I got nothing. Uh, just the uh, tape counter, no actual recording on the tape at all. So it's not just a playback problem, it was a recording problem too. Still feeling like it's electronic. Now, one of the things was that when I was installing that PPM meter, I moved a video recorder that was sat on the top of this out of the way so I could get some cabling in behind. And maybe there's a poor connection type problem that's caused the fault. So one thing I did was I uh, reseated all of the boards. Now, I've never known reseating boards to fix anything apart from maybe uh, you can't quite see this old multimeter here benefited from board reseating, but generally speaking, it doesn't make any difference. So I wasn't expecting anything to change. But of course, this did have a ton of equipment sat on it prior to the breakdown. Now I took the lid off, you know, I took all the equipment off and took the lid off and the fault remained. But it may be the act of moving the equipment up here into my workshop from the studio. I've been picking it up, carrying it around, has uh, fixed an intermittent fault or you know a connection problem so we may have an intermittent machine that that's a distinct possibility now what I want to do is show you some of the things I'd done in the studio which I couldn't set up with cameras at the time about looking at the tape path on this and this partly comes from a video I've seen on YouTube and I'll link to that below about how to service your well, really, BVW75 from, um, uh, it's actually an Ampex released video, but really it's talking about the Sony BVW75 analog Betacam SP machine. And one of the things they do is show you how to play a tape and get to the whole of the mechanism. And what you do is you take the cassette carriage out and then use a modified tape. And so I modified a tape the same way and they missed a bit out. So Ampex had said, get a, uh, a tape and take the lid off. Uh, and then you can put it in with no carriage, put a weight on it, and you can see the machine, you can see the tape alignment. So you take the front lid off this bit. But a clever thing about the Beta, and actually this is Beta Max as well, Beta Max design, is that the front lid also operate the brakes. So if you just take the front lid off, 
uh, you find that the reels are locked and you have to take the uh, brakes and springs off as well out of the sides and then you have a cassette which you can play with the carriage out. Let's demonstrate that. So easy access is everything on Sony professional equipment and I would say this is where Sony wins hands down compared to other professional manufacturers like Panasonic and JVC who don't think about field servicing so much. You look at something like a, an M2 uh, format machine, they're nowhere near as easy to work on as Betacam. Another interesting thing I noticed about the uh, BVW75 uh, video from Ampex was that they say uh, quite clearly that uh, beta cam is very similar to domestic beta max in terms of the tape path uh, and just to those people I'm thinking of you technology connections who say that beta max and beta cam are nothing to do with each other clearly uh, they are look at this you know this is all designed for fixability captive screws you know it's just beautifully beautifully designed Everything's designed so you can get to it. So we're looking now at the cassette carriage and look how easy it is to remove the cassette carriage from a Betacam and indeed Umatic from Sony. Isn't that gorgeous? And then they even make it easy to work on the equipment in this state so we can get our modified cassette and drop it in there at least what would have helped is if the last tape I'd had in here had been a small reel table uh, unfortunately the last tape I had in here was large so you have to put a small one in to get the reel tables to go in you could probably do it by going through some menus So we can simply drop that down carefully and then you need a weight to hold it down. What I'm going to do is go and get a weight and I'm also going to set you up so you can look down on the deck. The weight I've used here is actually a battery pack from a Technicolor uh, portable video recorder. So that's nice because it's a big even weight that can keep the tape fully down. It's very important that the tape is not allowed to spring up at all if you're looking at tape path alignment. These are connections to, I think it's the slip rings and maybe some amplifier equipment at the top here. Here's our head cleaner roller, which probably could use replacement on this one. Uh, the pinch roller has been replaced on this not too long ago. Not with a brand new one, but, the, but with a good one. Right, let's power it up. <coughs> goes straight into lace, like Betamax of course, well Sony Betamax anyway, and it's playing the tape with condition green. This is a fairly worn tape actually, but that's playing fine. So you can see that the tape all the way along is completely flat against its guides. The tape is not curling at the top and bottom anywhere, uh, and there isn't any kind of um, creases in the tape that could have potentially caused the fault we were seeing. Even though the, the machine is now fully working, it seems, it was right to look at this earlier and come to the conclusion that whatever was wrong with it was not a tape path fault. The sort of thing I was expecting to see was maybe a label from a customer's tape had fallen off and landed on a head drum, something like that. I've seen that before on other formats. So uh, you've got to look out for bits of sticky label or other debris that may have got onto the lower drum. There's a thing, if you have a fixed line, you need to be looking for a problem with a guide or lower drum. It's not likely to be an upper drum fault that causes a line through the picture, generally. You can't absolutely guarantee it because it might be that the head is losing contact at some part of the sweep if it's very worn. But generally speaking, if, if distinct line through the picture like that implies it's not an upper head drum fault. So I 
downstairs then released all of these and these cards and reseated them all um, I mean clearly some were nothing to do with it it's TBC and audio cards had nothing to do with it but I reseated them all anyway uh, and that didn't cure the fault at the time but seemingly moving the machine up the stairs did which is extremely suspicious isn't it now if we hit eject of course it can't eject but it will just unlace and now switch off and we can take out our test tape. Since we have the machine apart now it's worth checking that everything is clean and tidy in here. I had already cleaned the heads manually yesterday so uh, I needn't worry too much about that and the tape path, the guides are all clean, clean enough. Back goes the beautifully designed front loading mechanism. Nothing like it, is there? When space, time and money are not a consideration, you finish up with this sort of quality. OK, we've finished today with this uh, digital beta cam machine, DVWA500P. Do you think there's still an underlying fault? And if so, what do you think that fault could be? It's an interesting problem. Now, I may be picking up another one of these machines later in the year, and if I do, and if the fault returns, I could do some panel swapping to try to uh, maybe isolate a little bit more where that fault could be. But if it's intermittent, it could be a tricky one. OK, put that to one side for a minute. The JVC BRDV3000, I'm still waiting the power supply connector for this, uh, a little bit slow arriving. So we will come back to that. Now, I've been told that these may be Panasonic, though it doesn't feel very Panasonic inside, uh, and that sometimes they had a label on them saying, do not use Sony premium branded tapes. Well, that's hopeless, of course. It has to be able to play any good quality tape that's thrown at it. But it does indicate, possibly, that they had a design fault and it wasn't very robust. So I've got tape here. This is a JVC tape that I recorded on my own Canon camcorder. This was the last tape I recorded uh, for our family on DV uh, in 2016. So I want to try that one and not just see that it plays cleanly, but look at the error counts. And also, of course, we had the uh, DVC Pro tape we wanted to try by covering up the gold contacts, which was causing this machine, I believe that's the reason, the machine was spitting the tape out. So we'll come back to that uh, probably in the next video. I'll do plenty more content on audio and video technology especially, but I do also do some other things. And I've got something coming up which is technology related that I am really looking forward to uh, putting out there. It's uh, something very special. Here's a clue about what that may be about. Now I'll do plenty more content. Do please come by and watch that shortly. Bye for now.